So we learned last week this important point that God wants everybody to be a leader. Every Christian, everybody who knows him, God wants as a leader. So you must not forget that. God's leaders are not always those who lead in front. We learned that. But are those who lead from behind as well. So we made the distinction between salt and light. Salt is the governing ingredient in any curry. It is the controlling agent. So we can be leaders even from behind if we are willing to pay the price. And then we learn about light who are leaders right in front. We know that the light must shine. So we know as Christians we must be the example. So when people look at us and say, hey, that's the way to behave. We also learn that God is not concerned of somebody's background, what type of background you have, ethnic origin, race, talents, abilities, language, proficiency, intelligence, sign of a, or size or experience, which is not as important, not, not that it's not important. They may have some bearing somewhere, but when compared to God's choice, it is not as important. He is more interested in the relationship you have with Him. He says, what type of relationship are you walking, are you talking with Him? The kind of person, how important do you make God in your life? You know, in uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5, it says this, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? In Romans 8, 37, he tells us, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors. So the next one we learn. Ah, uh, yeah, sorry. I went faster. The first and foremost requirement of leadership with God is to know the word and laws of God. If you do not bother to study or listen or learn the words of God, then you automatically disqualify yourself. So you know that you must know the Word of God. I'm not going to repeat uh, why you should do this and how it's proven, but the fact is you have to know the Word of God. Then boldness is a requirement. You must overcome. You must be a person who's able to stand before Pharaoh and take your position. You must be a person who's able to stand for Christianity. You know those brothers and sisters we saw in the video? They are able to stand. He says you go there, you don't know whether tomorrow you're alive. That is Christianity. I don't know what the world teaches today, but the real Christianity is that. And those are the people God is coming to be with, and we are included. Let me tell you, if not, He won't give us the video. If not, He won't speak to us the way we are included. So He's pulling us and drawing us closer to Him, closer to Him, so we can participate. And one day, maybe we will be called to do the same thing. We do not know. So boldness is a requirement if you are a Christian. Boldness is a requirement if you are a leader for God. That's why he says in Romans 8.37 that in all these things we are more than conquerors. Another point, the Christian life is always a life of challenge. You will find that God is always challenging you. In everything, it's always a challenge. Once you've finished this problem, another one comes up. You've settled that issue, another one comes up. You finish the mediation, suddenly you find the next day the fellow comes and says, sorry, no settlement. You know, suddenly you think you've got all your financials settled, suddenly you find income tax landing on your table. So you see, that's how God operates. He wants to stretch you. So the Christian life, the leader's life, because God is making you a leader, is constant challenge. You can come in the form of health, you can come in the form of finance, you can come in the form of fighting the family, you can come in any form. But recognize that it's a challenge and it's not something bad. It's an opportunity to promote you. It's an opportunity to train you and become better. So if you get the right attitude, you will progress very fast. If you don't, you will take another round the desert. And it may take 40 years, but you will still go around the desert. So you have to have that right attitude. Say, Lord, I recognize that the Christian life is a life of challenge. Like that pastor, like that father, Douglas, you know, he said, I will go. And even after all that he went through, he still goes back. Oh, it's amazing, but he's rising, he's learning, he's growing. He is growing. So you must take a position for God wherever you are, even if the majority is against you. You must be able to stand for God and speak to the king. And I say the king, I speak of authorities to stand like what Hannah is doing, standing and speaking and saying, no, I am a Christian. I am a Christian, you know. And there are many more examples I don't want to refer to. But the idea is we have to do that. 
I make this exception. You may start frightened. You may be a person who is scared. Oh Lord, I, I just can't. Don't worry, I shared about Gideon, right? Gideon was a man scared. He was hiding, you know, hiding things. But God said, you mighty man of valor. So you may start frightened. You may start with all kinds of weaknesses. But God will graduate you. God will graduate you like he graduated Gideon, like he graduated David, like he graduated Moses. He will graduate. He will pro progress progressively. All you got to do is keep moving. All you got to do is keep moving and have the right attitude. The important point, you must obey. One of the most important points with regards to, to uh, being a leader for God is obedience. Remember, to obey is more important than sacrifice. Though you must obey, you must clear that it is God who spoke to you. It's one thing to say, I'll obey God. God, I will obey you. I will follow you. But you must be clear that it is the voice of God. So some people have difficulty obeying. Some people do not know when God is speaking to them. They think God spoke to them. So how do you reconcile the dilemma? This is how you reconcile it. Number one, you must obey. If it is God and you are 100%, it is God, obey. Because obedience is better than sacrifice, you know. But how to know God spoke? These are some of the ways you will know that it is the Lord. One, God will never contradict His Word. You know the Word of God? The written Word or the oral Word. He will never contradict His Word. You can be rest assured. He is too good. He will follow His Word to the T. And that's what we learn from the life of Elijah. God followed the Word of God. So He will never contradict. So if He tells you something that contradicts the Word of God, you've got to check ten times. He wouldn't. He wouldn't contradict the Word of God. So whatever He tells you, if that is God, if that person, that spirit is God, it will be in line with the Word of God. It will be congruent. It will be in context. It won't be an absurd thing. Just take it You will find that it's a build-up. It is in context. You know, because God is a God of plan, design, purpose, and objectivity. So if He decides for your family to be together, it won't be suddenly it says, no, family split up. All, I want all, husband, wife, everybody just split up. It won't be like that. You know, because why? I hate my wife, or I hate my son, or I hate my whatever. He won't. Because God planned it. You know? So when God deals with you, what I want to know, I want you to know is He always has a design. He has a purpose. He has a plan. He has a objectivity. Same thing with working. If He sets you in a working place, and He trained you in that working place, suddenly He won't tell you, fine, forget about that work. Don't have to work there anymore. He won't do that. He will structure it. Everything that you have done there will be of benefit in whatever He's calling you into. So if you were somebody in Pharaoh's court, you studied the history of Samaria, you studied this, you will find that He will take you and use that in the next mission. If you were Joseph in Potiphar's house, and you, did, you will find that He will lead you and suddenly you are ruling Egypt. So you find the pattern is there. God starts from beginning. When you are born, right up to the day you die. So he doesn't suddenly go zigzag. So I want you to remember that there is consistency. So you know if that happens. And, and of course, he will put people in your lives. So you must check. If you don't, then suddenly you see, I'm hearing voices. So you have the Jim Jones, you have the David Koresh's, you have all these crazy people who suddenly say, oh, I heard a voice. And I do that. You don't want to be that. We all want to hear the word of God, but we want to make sure that there are checks and balances in our lives. So you've got people which you can check with. So you check with the Word of God. You always see it's in context. It must be in order. Then you've got people who you can check with, people who God put in your life. Your father and mother are very good people to check with. These are uh, given spiritually. Your wife and husband is a good person to check with. Your partners in the law firm are a good person to check with. And of course, spiritually, your church, members who are in your church. You will find, you can check with different, different people. It doesn't matter. But you check, the Lord will confirm through signs and wonders. You know when uh, Carol shared how the Lord shows in the, in the, uh, the cloud and the rainbow. Amazing! Again, speaking about a covenant that He will not destroy. Again, again speaking about a covenant. So God will do it through signs and wonders. So He doesn't have a problem confirming and reconfirming. He's got no problem. Just keep asking. And He will confirm. He wants you to do something. He'll give you dreams, vision, speaks to people, gives you a word, everything. So don't hesitate to ask Him. But don't be in a position where you say, no, I'll be a law unto myself. I'll decide whatever I want and proceed. Because I heard God. Then you will find that eventually you move down the track. Okay? Alright. <coughs> we know that Elijah knew the word of God. 
And what was the word of God? Very simple, Deuteronomy 11, verse 13 to 17. It says, you love the God, the Lord your God, and serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul. Then I will give you rain from the land in its season, and early rain and latter rain, that you may gather your grain and your new wine and have oil. If you don't, and you serve other gods, very simple, I shut up the heavens, that there be no rain, and the land yields no produce. Very simple, isn't it? This is Deuteronomy, Moses' time. Moses' time this is happening. You know? So now Elijah knew the word of God because he comes to Ahab and he says, the heavens are going to be shut up. So when you look at the background of what is happening in Israel at the time, you will realize that it is in line with the word of God. It is in context. It is in line with what is transpiring. So you know that the word of God truly came to Elijah and God is backing that man, that man. I want to just digress a little bit and give you this point. Elijah was an obscure man. People didn't know about him. We know him today as a great prophet. But when, you, when he's introduced to us in 1 Kings, in 1 Kings uh, chapter 17, yeah, he's introduced to us, he says he was just a man in Gilead, one of the settlers, unknown. But at the end, he is the spokesman for, against the king. Or he speaks for God against the king. He stands there. He is the one that stands on the, on the Mount Carmel and makes a declaration for the people to follow God. He becomes a national figure. He becomes an international figure. From nowhere to, some, to, a, to a tremendous power on the face of the earth. I want you to recognize that principle. David is a boy in the desert. Unknown. In fact, the father said, no, we've got a small fellow, no need to call him. Unknown. Obscure. Man, meditating on the word of God. Spending time with the Lord. Suddenly, Goliath is an issue and he comes. And the killing of Goliath, Goliath propels him into the international arena. Now the Philistines know him. The armies know Everybody knows him. Overnight, he becomes a national figure and an international figure. Joseph is lying in the dungeon, man. Nobody knows him. For years, people, he's been there with God. Suddenly, you become second to only Pharaoh. It's an overnight thing. It's a transition. But the training, the root that is under the ground takes a longer time. Nobody sees, but the root is growing. I want you to know that whatever you do for God, it is growing. It's growing deeper and deeper. The roots are growing. And then the tree shoots out. And when the tree shoots, it brings shade and cover and protection for a lot of people. So get this point. Don't be weary of doing good. Let's keep doing what we should do. What we should do. The important part we must remember always is the Word of God. The Word of God. Meditating on the Word of God brings healing to the marrow of our bones. Meditating on the Word of God brings protection. That's why David says, I meditate on the Word of God daily. Elijah meditated on the Word of God daily. He knew the Word of God. And if you see how he conducted himself, you will know he knew every part of the Word of God. As I was reading, I said, wow, I didn't know all his actions were in line with the Word of God. Everything he did was in line with something already written by Moses, which is amazing. How did he do that? I mean, how he must have known. He had meditated, he had memorized the Word of God. David too, you know, in Psalms 119 verse 11, he says, Your word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. You don't want to sin? You don't want to fail? Memorize the word of God. So the word of God has so much to give you. All you got to do is meditate on the word of God. Next point, faithfulness. See, in order to meditate on the word of God, in order to learn from the word of God, in order to do the things that God wants to do, you to do, you have to be faithful. That's a requirement for a leader. Faithfulness. Now what is faithfulness? Faithfulness can be defined in so many ways, but I'd like to tell you for the, today, it is constantly doing something. Constantly doing something. You're faithful at doing that. So you're given a Bible class, I'm faithfully teaching the Bible class. If you're handling a feeding program, I'm faithfully doing that. If I am uh, given a music I'm faithfully doing that. If you are faithful, the scripture says, in the little, I will give you much. Let me give you the verse. In Luke 16, verse 10, it says this, Whoever is faithful with the very little 
will also be faithful with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. It is simple. If you lie over a small thing, you're not going to be truthful over a big thing. We all, conv- uh, we all convince ourselves, it's okay, it's a white lie. There's no such thing. <laughs> it's a white lie. There's, there's no such thing. If you lie the little, I want you to know, you will lie. You will lie when it comes to the big things. But if you are faithful in what the task is given, it can be the smallest task of owning the lights. If you are faithful, God says He will put you over much. You will be faithful in the much. You will be faithful in the much. He's calling the faithful. He is faithful. God is faithful and He's calling the faithful. My question is, are you faithful in what God has given you to do? You know, somebody asked me, I won't mention who, somebody asked me, you know, you already got it in text. Why do you have to put so much trouble into this particular matter? It's a case. You know, you already got it. Just r- relax, you're already done. I said, no, I'm, I just don't feel that I've given my best. And until I've given my best, I don't want to stop. I don't want to stop. And I want you to know that that's how you must function. That's what God is looking for. The ESV in Matthew 25 verse 23 says this, His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. I will set you over much. So if you go back to the patterns of the leaders we have, you go back to David, he was faithful with that few sheep. God placed him over much. He became king of whole of Israel king of all of Israel. Joseph was faithful in Potiphar's house. He prospered Potiphar. Joseph was faithful in the prison. He was appointed, even though under those circumstances. You know, when you're a slave, huh, it's hard to be faithful. Because they bully you, they do all kinds of things. You just have to do the job. But he did more than his job, that he was promoted. And you're a prisoner, you want to gripe. You want to say, why am I here? Most, uh, Joseph does more than is required and he's promoted even in the prison and put in charge. Then only you're promoted to be in charge of the whole country. If I can't trust you with a few people, how am I going to trust you with a whole congregation? If I can't trust you with one small family, how am I going to put you in charge of so many families? If I can't trust you with 5,000 ringgit, how am I going to give you 10 million or 500 million ringgit? If you cannot tie it, with 10,000 that you have, how are you going to tie it when you've got 10 million? Be faithful in what God has given you. Get this, God's leader must be faithful in the little. He will be given much. And what comes to mind is Jacob. Jacob there is in Laban. Laban is his uncle. And Jacob is working and wake, working. But if you read, Jacob says, I have been faithful all these years. Give me what is my, enti- what is enti- my entitlement. And the scripture says, God blessed, God heard, and God blessed Jacob. And he became, in fact, Israel. And that is who the Jewish people come from. He, and they get their name from him. Jacob, who became Israel. He was faithful. So everywhere you look, the chap is faithful. So I know that Elijah was faithful. He was faithful whatever God called him to do. He studied the word of God. He hid the word of God in his heart. He knew the word of God. He was ready. He was ready when the time came to go forth. So, in 1 Kings 17, they say, Elijah suddenly appears before the king of Israel. And he says this in 1 Kings 17, verse 1. As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be no dew or rain these three years, except at my word. Elijah, who are you talking to? This is the king of Israel. He just says the word and your head will chopped off. And he says this to the king. Do you see the elements of boldness? Do you see the element that this is in line with the scriptures? Because if you worship another god, he shuts up the rain. So Elijah was declaring the word of God. Elijah was enforcing the word of God in his time. He said, God, your will be done in heaven as it is done on earth. Or your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven heaven. That's what he was saying. I want God's will 
And since God declared it, then the heavens will shut up because the people have decided to worship another God. You see, the condition of Israel was bad at that time. Ahab was king, but he worshipped Baal, another god. And he led the people also to worship. He built an altar to Astaroth. He built altars to another god. And they're not supposed to do this. Moses said, you shall not worship any other god. You shall not build any idols of things in the heavens, on the earth, or under the earth. This is the Ten Commandments, which is sacred to the Israelites. And still, they chose to abandon that. Because their king decided to abandon that. He abandoned that because he married Jezebel. And Jezebel brought her prophets and brought her gods into the kingdom. Into the kingdom. And we know from last week's message that there were 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Astaroth. You must know that they are, all these people were, were very famous. They were eating at the king's table. They don't say a king's table, by the way. They say they ate at Jezebel's table. Jezebel's table is a royal table. You're given special privileges. You were, the king is paying for you. So you're a government official. And government officials, you know how they act. They have authority. They have power. What happened to God's prophets? That's my question. What happened to the people of God who represent God? The scripture is very clear. They went into hiding. Because Jezebel ordered them killed. And the king said, fine, kill them. Kill anybody who stands for God. Kill anybody who's a Christian. Because we want to worship another God. We, and the people, that's fine. So the prophets are in hiding. And this is what Elijah says, stop the rain. Stop the rain. So now you have three and a half years, and, the, and God stopped the rain. Let me say, after Elijah told the king, Elijah disappears. Okay, he disappears. And he goes to the widow in Zarephath and he does his thing. For three years, no one can see him. And what happens to the land? What happens when there's no rain for two weeks <laughs> in our country? It's a mess. For three and a half years, no rain. Huh? It's serious. The ground becomes dusty. The streams dry up. The brooks dry up. There's no more. Even grass will be hard to find. You can't even find grass. And I, and I quote 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 5. It says this, And Ahab said to Obadiah, Go into the land, to all the springs of water, and to all the brooks. Perhaps we may find grass to keep the horses and mules alive, so that we will not have to kill any livestock. They didn't have where they were. Go into all the land, go and find. Maybe we will find some grass for the horses. That's how serious it is. So when the situation is serious, when God is acting, when there is a sign that you're very clear that something is happening, the man of God, the leader of God must stand up and say, we must do something. Is there not a cause? Is what David said. When his brothers told him, go, David, he said, is there not a cause? Goliath is challenging Goliath is terrorizing. Is there not a cause? Is there not a challenge? That's what Israel, Elijah is doing. Is there not a problem in Israel? We have to do something. And I will tell, remind them, shut up. Because that's what Deuteronomy 11 says. If you did that, and I want you to know all your people that you did that, and therefore the heavens are shut up. So all those years, those people were thinking, why is there no rain? Because we are praying to Baal. We are praying to Asteroid. We are doing all these things. But why aren't we blessed? Why isn't our lives fantastic? What is happening? Why is there no joy? Why is there no peace? Why is that? People were asking for those three years. So I want you to understand their mindset. They are hungry because no food. They are thirsty because not enough water. Water is scarce. They are frustrated. So you must remember that is the condition of the people. And the challenge is this. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 19 and 20. Now they send. He tells Ahab, send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel. So God told uh, Elijah, go and see the king. And I, we need to have rain in your people because people will die. 
So he goes, and this is the challenge he gives. So after he meets, uh, long story how he meets, because uh, all, the, all the prophets are being killed. So Obadiah was sold to go and get uh, Elijah. And he's saying, Elijah, don't run away. You know, don't, don't go away because you will disappear. And if you disappear, the king will kill me. That's how the king is. He'll kill. And Obadiah was a trusted servant of the king. So Elijah said, don't worry, I will stand. Are you sure, Elijah, you understand? If the king comes, he kills you with his soldiers, you're finished. But he is bold because he is standing for God. He knows Jehovah will back him. God will back him. So he tells Ahab this when he sees Ahab. Ahab's response, oh, you troubler of Israel. He's so angry. And, and Elijah's response, I have not troubled Israel. You have troubled Israel. He tells Ahab, you have troubled because of what you did. So you see, he's not afraid to speak the truth. It reminds me of Nathan. It is you, David, who has done this. The prophets of God, the leaders of God, has no choice but to declare the truth. You may be hated. You may be disliked. But that is the call. If you want to be a Christian, you've got to declare the truth. The Bible says, what does the Lord require of you? In Micah 6, eight, To love kindness, to do justice, and to walk humbly before Him. It is not an option. He requires you to love kindness. He requires you to do justice. And He requires you to walk humbly before Him. So it's not an option to remain silent when there is a challenge. It's not an option when there is trouble to say, no, I, I just want to look after myself and take care of myself, my family, and that's it. You have to stand up. That's the call of becoming a Christian. So Elijah comes on the scene. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 19 and 20. Now then, send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel. He tells that to the king. Send and gather all Israel, Mount Carmel, together with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Astrod, who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab said, fine, we will do that. So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. So I want you to imagine that. <clears throat> now in Saul's time, now Ahab is after Saul, there were 200,000 soldiers, a minimum of 200,000 soldiers coming together. By the time Ahab's time, they have conquered more territories. He's one of the, I think, third or fourth uh, kings who enlarged the territories of uh, Israel. So he had a lot of people. In his. Gather all of them in Mount Carmel and gather the 450 and the 400. I want you to imagine what's happening. So I took some shots to show you. This is Mount Carmel. <coughs> this is how roughly Mount Carmel looks. I went to Mount Carmel and this is where I saw. They have put a statue of Israel. They put a sorry statue of Elijah there. So that's where Elijah was, to remember the event. And the mountain is on top. You see one building there? Now I'm going to show you a clip which I took when I went to that building. Excuse the breathlessness because I had to climb a lot of stairs. You've got to climb up the, the thing. But enjoy the clip. This is the view of Mount Carmel. Oh, this is where Elijah stood. Challenging the prophets of Baal. Who is God? The God of Baal? Oh, the God of Israel. Amazing. This place. Look at that. Yeah. Look at that. You can see. Amazing. Okay, that's a real life shot, you know, of seeing what Mount Carmel is. You know, the, the plains that you see down there is actually also called the Valley of Amagadan. It's so flat nah, with all the nations in come. So they say the last battle will be held there. But Mount Carmel is overlooking it. They go up the hill. So this is where Elijah called all the prophets to come together. 450 around, 400 the other side, Astrod, then hundreds and thousands of people. Just imagine the scene. And he is there, standing. One man against the rest. 450, 400. Just imagine, even 100 people. The size is amazing. Just picture yourself. Because one slip, you're finished, Elijah. <laughs> the fellows will take you out. One mistake. It just takes one of those mad 450 prophets or the 400 other prophets of Astrod to take you down. So Elijah is one corner, they're one corner. 
All right, so the contest begins. The contest begins. And this is what Elijah says. He came near to all the people. He comes to his people, the hundreds and thousands, he comes there. And he said, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. In verse 22, Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophet is 450. He's saying, I'm one. And there's 450. And I told you the odds that God likes. But he just takes one man. Don't think you need a whole generation. You need a whole uh, army or a whole group or a whole committee. It takes one man to stand up for God. But a committed man, a faithful man, a bold man, a prayerful man. It takes that man, a man who knows the word of God. It takes that one man to stand up. So Elijah stands up. He stands up and he declares. Well, what is the response of the people when he makes this challenge? Because there is a crisis. He, there is a challenge given. What is the people's response? It's very clear. The scripture says they remain quiet. They did not say anything. But the people did not answer him a word. So Elijah is telling, hey, listen guys, if God is true, then follow him. Why are you going and following the other time? If God is true, trust him for your sustenance. Trust him for your promotion. Trust him for your protection. Trust him for your healing. If God is true. But the people remain silent. The people remain silent. Many times, people remain quiet. Why do people remain quiet? These are Christians. These are people who know Jehovah. These are the, the descendants of Abraham. The descendants of Israel. These are the people who know about all that God has done. They follow the Torah. Why do they remain quiet when the preacher challenges or the prophet challenges them? Why do people remain quiet? Because somewhere along the line, they compromised. Somewhere along the line, they just believed in the ways of the world. Somewhere along the line, they said, never mind, God, this is okay. This is okay. Others is okay. But God is very clear. It is Him. He's either all or nothing. There is no in between. So Elijah is risking his life when he says the next word, verse 27. Cry aloud, he tells the prophets of Baal. If he is a god, then he must be meditating or he must be busy or he's on a journey or perhaps he's sleeping and must be awakened. You see the level of boldness. Now we look, we smile. But you got 450 there, 400. You got the king waiting to kill you. And you got hundreds and thousands looking down. And you ask a question, no response. <laughs> you make a challenge, no response. But you can see the boldness in Elijah. This is a do or die mission. <laughs> Either I make it or it's over. Because I might as well go all the way. So I, I push. I push it to the extreme. Socrates says in order to see a truth in a particular area, you've got to push it to the extreme. If you keep it along the grey areas, you will not know what is right and what is wrong. That's Socrates. But Elijah is applying it here. It's amazing. He's pushing it to the extreme. He says, if it's a God, then answer. Lah. If your God is real, then get healed by Him. If your God is real, He will provide. He must be sleeping. So the people are listening. The people are listening and saying, oh, yes, that's true. That's true because he wants to culminate with an action. Elijah is preparing the people. He wants to culminate with an action. Elijah does that. Remember that the people, they like recognition. They like to stay with the majority. They like that they have a peaceful environment. Everybody is happy. Every they don't like challenges. They don't like to be questioned. So sometimes churches also, the preacher men, do not challenge. They don't challenge. They make it very comfortable, everything nice. Don't worry, have a wonderful life, prosperous, everybody is good. I'm trying to tell you, if you're not challenged, you're in the wrong church. If you're not challenged to change, then... The church is the wrong church, Which, whichever church it can be. Christianity is a, it's always a challenge. It's always a challenge. It's always growing. It's always developing. It's always becoming better. Sometimes we are not clear with our stand. We're not clear where we stand. For God, for what is right, for justice, for fairness, for truth. Or do we remain quiet? You think they only remain quiet? 
when there was a challenge. There's a challenge. Raymond Coe has been missing for months. There is a challenge. But do we remain quiet? Hannah Yu is in trouble because a, a lecturer from UM lodged a police report against her because she wrote a book saying that she's a Christian. Are we quiet? That's a challenge. Are the Christians standing up and saying, that's ridiculous? In Facebook, in email, wherever you are standing up and being counted. Or do you want to remain quiet like the children of Israel? Quiet, don't, don't, don't say anything. Don't rock the boat. Don't, don't, let's not do anything. We are living a peaceful life. We've got the government with us. We're not tra tra troubling with, we don't have trouble with the police. You know? Well, how, are we standing and saying that's wrong? So I want you to know that we are required to stand up. We are required to, to do justice, to love kindness. Love kindness, do justice and walk humbly before our God. Our also went down in, in uh, Indonesia. You know what happened, right? He lost the governor's post. We don't know what the Christians are doing. And then you have President Trump in America making a stand. And you have Christians taking pot shots at him. So strange. They don't only remain quiet. At least they remain quiet is something. They are now going with the prophets of Baal to go and stone. Even though all the prophets of God, all the prophets are saying that this man has been appointed by God. It's amazing, you know, but there are those who remain quiet. I'm talking about those who keep quiet, but most of us remain quiet. I want you to know that this is a challenge given by God. He uses various people to do challenges. There was a challenge in the old time. Goliath gave a challenge. I want you to know, he challenged the people of Israel. Because God is always challenging. There's always challenges in your room, in your house, in your relationships, in your office, in your profession, there will be a challenge. And here was Goliath. You can call him the devil. Challenging the armies of the living God. They also kept quiet. Do you notice? Same pattern. The people kept quiet. Hundreds and thousands of them, 200,000, kept quiet. First Samuel chapter 17 Verse 16 says, Goliath came out and gave his challenge every morning and every evening for 40 days. Goliath is here, is challenging every day, every morning, every evening, and nobody is answering. The people remain quiet. Here are soldiers, generals, kings, captains in God's kingdom, all quiet. Saul, verse 11 says, Saul and his men heard what Goliath said. Not that they didn't hear. But they were so frightened of Goliath that they could not do a thing. I was sharing with Joshua in the office uh, that there was an issue where somebody was traveling on the road and somebody had blocked his pathway and he horned. And a group of people came then and assaulted him and said, you shouldn't have horned. You shouldn't have horned because horning is rude. So they whacked him out of shape. He's injured and he's taken to hospital and all that. So when I said in a WhatsApp group that I thought that was un unbecoming behavior, you know, definitely shouldn't come and assaulted the driver. You scold him for whatever, that, that's separate. Or you shouldn't block the way in the first place, you know. Uh, but you should never have assaulted him. And I got a response in the WhatsApp group. He deserved it. I, I was I just amazed. Why deserve it? No, because he should know the sensitivities. Should not horn. He should not horn. He's a fool to horn. I said, even if you take that argument, he's a fool to horn. The response must be proportionate to the offense. He's all I mean, overreacted and came and hammered the fellow. Oh, no, no, no. I still think he should not. He should have known this. So the, I told him, like, it's easy to kick the cat. It's easy to kick the cat. You know what's the mentality? Kick the cat. The one with the least opposition, whack him. So I cannot fight my mother, cannot fight the, my neighbor. I'm angry at the wife. The cat, nobody knows to give one kick. <laughs> because he doesn't know, he cannot fight back. He cannot do anything. You know? But Christians cannot do that. I want you to know, Christians, you cannot do that. You must defend the cat. <laughs> you must stand and defend the cat when there is a challenge. I want to encourage you. Let's all do that. So in Goliath's time, all these people are remaining quiet and it takes a boy 
you know, actually God used a boy. If you know God's sense of humor, because everything, God does one million things with one act. We only can see five or ten, but one million. And I tell you one of the things he did. He gave a slap to all the powerful men there. He just gave one slap and said, I'm going to use a boy. I'm not going to use a great warrior. I'm not going to use one of the captains. I'm going to use a small boy. And he's not even going to use your, your weapons. How do you know God is like, thinks this way? How do you know God thinks this way? Because another time he told a general, because you did not want to do I'm going to use a woman. Give you a slap. I'm going to use a woman to save. He's going to kill the enemy. Because at that time they thought men are great, you see. All these he men, you know, these women. But God was giving the man a slap, telling you, because you were afraid, because I'm going to use a woman. So God is like that. He's saying, listen, you guys can stand up for God. You don't have to use a child. But God used David. And David brought the victory. Get this. When you hear a challenge, do not turn away. Do not be quiet or be afraid. Don't say, I am tired. Oh, please, I had enough. Do not disqualify yourself and say, no, I'm a wicked man. If I say it, they say, what type of crook you are? Isn't it? We all get afraid. Do not say that. Recognize it's an opportunity for you. Every challenge is an opportunity for you. Challenges come to train and equip you. Challenges come to promote you. So if you look at a challenge as a promotion, whoa, you are learning, you're growing, you're growing, you're growing. The next one, verse 30 says, Elijah said to all the people, come near. Why is Elijah saying, come near to me? So all the people come near, came near. So he must have been of a distance for him to say, come near. Don't stay far away, come near. They all must have been on the other side. Must have been quite a distance, you see. So they all must have been on the other side. Who's the other side? The 450 and 400. So she said, guys, come nearer to me. Come on, Christians, come nearer to me, saying. And what did he do? He repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Look at verse 30. He repaired the altar of God who had been torn down. How sad. Sometimes in our lives, I want to ask you, is the altar of God torn down? Is your communication with God affected? Are you in communication with God as you were last time? How you were before Him, enjoying, always before, always thinking, always before God? Or has somehow the things of the world crept in? Somehow they crept in and He doesn't take that much priority anymore. Sometimes we too need to build up and build back our altars with God. The relationship with God, we need to build. Elijah had to do that for the people. He had to rebuild. He's telling them, come, let's look at the altar of the Lord and let's build it. It's been torn down. It's been forgotten. And he's trying to tell the people, remember, remember, remember. Why? Because he takes 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob. So to whom the word of the Lord came saying, Israel shall be your name. So he said, bring 12 stones. And I want, to know, I want you to know, it's not the tiny pebbles, huge stones that they had to carry on their shoulders. 12, only 12. Because when they started doing that, the people began to remember. The people began to remember. Hey, this is familiar. This happened, this happened when? When Joshua was going into the promised land, leading us into the promised land. When Joshua was leading us, they took 12 stones. He remembers Joshua chapter 4, verse 6, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you will tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. The Lord stopped the waters in Jordan. So they could cross. And he said, take 12 stones. And they carried 12 stones. And they made an altar. They made a, a thing, a memorial to God. So the children remembered, hey, we have forgotten what God has done for us. We have forgotten. For 400 years, we were in slavery. He took us out of darkness and brought us into wonderful light. We have forgotten that we were walking through the desert in total dependence on God. And when we got into the promised land, he stopped the waters. And he took the Ark of Covenant. And what does the covenant mean? God was saying, I have a covenant with you forever. 
is not to be broken. But you have broken the altar. You have left and followed another God. You have. So he puts that altar there. And, and, and what does he say? When the children ask you, you will say this, you will say that. So remember, a covenant cannot be broken. Do you remember the prodigal son? Do you remember the prodigal son? He also forgot everything his father did for him. Oh, he felt it wasn't good. He decided to leave and go to a far country. He decided to do it his own way. And the years went by. He's an adult now. He's living his life. And he ends up feeding pigs. And do you know? He remembered. The scripture says he came to his senses. He remembered what? What his father had done for him. He remembered what his father had done for him. Do you remember what your father has done for you? Because the people watched Elijah gather the stones and build the altar and they began to remember that each stone symbolizes the tribe that they belong to. Each stone reminded them that God is a covenant-keeping God. Each stone reminded them that God had brought them into this promised land. God is the one. God is the one. God brought me into our promise. God brought all of us into the promised land. He stopped the waters, and waters speak of trouble. It speaks about the Word of God, but it also speaks of trouble. He stops the troubles. A new and welcome chapter opens up before them. Before them lay a richer land than their dreams, more fruitful than their hopes, and more beautiful than their imagination. Now it is theirs by God's steadfast promise. You're no longer so dependent like in the desert, the cloud by night, a cloud by day, and a fire by night. You no longer have to wait for quails to fall down. You no longer have to wait for water to depend on God. You are free to do your own thing. You are independent. You are independent. My question, are we like that in our lives? Do we have situations that we have enjoyed and been blessed and suddenly we find now we don't need God so much? Now we don't spend as much time with the Word of God. Joshua 4 says this, Each man from the tribes carried a stone on his shoulder and laid it as a sign, as a memorial. Joshua chapter 4 tells you that. And when people ask what these stones mean, then God says, tell them the story. Tell them the story. What story, Lord? It is found in Joshua 4, verse 23 and 24. This is the story God wanted them to remember. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan before you until you had crossed over, just as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before you until we, crossed, we had crossed over. This is so that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord's hand is mighty, and so that you may always fear the Lord your God. That's what he wanted them to know. Tell a story, he said. Tell your children, tell yourself, remind yourself. But we've got to remember something else. This God did all that for him. Gave them food, protected them, took them out of slavery, did all that. But for us, he did something more. He died for us. Much more than what he done for them. He died for us. He died for us. So when we look at our God, we say, you gave the ultimate price. You and we remember every time we take communion that God gave the ultimate price price. Elijah reminded the people of God, what did your God do for you? Now God laid this on my heart, I'm going to lay it to you. God wants you today to remember what God has done for you. God wants you today to remember what God has done in your life. He said when you were in a bind, you cried out to Him and He came through and He did it for you. He said when you had Financial difficulties. You cried out and he brought in financial assistance. You had shelter issues. I didn't know where to stay. I didn't know. You had food issues. But he said, I came through. I came through. God said, now I've prospered you. You have extra money. You can travel. You have so much freedom. Just like the children of Israel. When I brought them into the promised land, a land flowing of milk and honey and everything is good, they forgot. 
They forgot who did that. My question, have you compromised? Are you holding two positions in your life? One for God and one for the world? Have you lost your first love? The first love you had for God. God wants you to remember how it was in the beginning. God wants you to remember how it was in the beginning. God said to tell you this, Jeremiah 30, 31, 3. The Lord appeared to him from afar and said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And I have drawn you with loving kindness. God said to tell you that. He said, he has not forgotten. Even if you have forgotten, said, I have not forgotten you. I have not forgotten each and every one of you. I love you with an everlasting love. And I will bring you with my loving kindness. In Isaiah 49 verse 15, he says this, Can a mother forget her child? He says, even if a mother were to forget her child, I will never forget you. And that's what Elijah was doing. Elijah was telling them, listen, the Lord God has not forgotten you. He is going to come through. He is going to show himself God. He is going to look at that. When I say the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the Lord God of Israel, the fire will come. That's what Elijah is going to do. Elijah is going to do that. And I want you to know when you do that, the fire will come. The fire will come. And it came to pass at the time of the offering and the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, see, remember who you are. Let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that these people may know that you are the Lord and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. We need to turn our hearts back to God again. And the heart that I'm talking about is a heart that is fully committed, totally committed to the Lord. He is the one. He is the most important one in our lives. And that's the job of a leader. That's your job in, as a chief priest in the house. That's your job to turn the hearts of the people to God. And then you find the fire fell. The fire fell. God consumes the sacrifice because now the people's hearts have been reminded, have been turned towards God. They recognize, oh, we remember, Lord. We remember how often we forget. You know, I had a, I, while doing this, I, I asked God. God said, the people forget, son. Always they forget. If you cannot remember in such a short time on earth, how are you going to remember throughout eternity? It blew me, you know, because he said, on earth itself, we can forget. In fact, Mahathir says, give the people 100 days and they will forget it. So what must we do? We must write it on the tablets of our heart. We've got to write it in the palm of our hand. We've got to put it on the doorpost. We've got to put pictures everywhere. We've got to remind ourselves. We've got to remind each other. We've got to have some institutions. We've got to have some ceremonies to remind us constantly of the goodness of our God so that we will sing of His mercies and tell of His goodness. That's what we must do all the time. We've got to keep talking about our God and we will remember and we will not forget and we will hide the Word of God in our hearts and we will not sin against Him. We won't worship another God because our God is our all in all. He is beautiful. He loves us. And that's what He says. I love you. Don't you know that you have a covenant with me? Don't you know that you are mine and I am yours? Don't you know that I'm coming back for you? Don't you know? He says that. And He wants to be with you. End of the day, um, we find that all the Baal's prophets were killed and there was rain. There was rain, okay? Um, I'll probably do that next week. <coughs> For you just to remember that the Lord God loves you. Remember what you have experienced before Him.